<laughs> your honesty. You you are so honest for a lawyer. Honestly, <laughs> we're all honest. We're all honest. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a I'm a big fan of legal TV, legal films, and and books. I'm a big John Grisham fan. But this book is fantastic. It's um it's called a civil action. And it's written by Jonathan High. It was um it was written in um it was published I think in 1995. It was made into a Hollywood movie with uh, John Travolta, Robert Duvall. It's it's a brilliant movie if everyone wants to watch it. But the book is fascinating. It's really fascinating to a lawyer, but it's a fascinating story. It's all about a, a group action a class action in america the really fascinating thing about it is you've got a really flash personal injury lawyer who is really in it for the money he's got a very flash lifestyle and then he's um, approached by some families in a small town in massachusetts called woburn to bring a claim for a number of children who've got a leukemia and they think it's been caused by the drinking water in the town and there were a couple of factories there's a tannery and a, a factory on the river that they thought were polluting the river. These are very complicated legal actions to bring. In America, you can probably imagine, it's, it's hugely expensive. And this PI lawyer, who was quite wealthy and really good firm, got very, very personally involved in this case. And it, was, it became a crusade for him. He basically spent all of his money. He spent all his firm's money. Everyone in the firm was mortgaged up to the health bringing this case. He was desperate not to settle it, but he wanted his day in court. He made legal decisions that were crazy. He should have settled them, but they were making big offers. He didn't take them. He made ridiculous demands of the defendant. He took it to trial. It's probably a spoiler alert if you ever read it. Um, <laughs> they had some very good lawyers on the defendant's side, some very high profile lawyers in, in Boston who managed to manipulate the case so that the, the families didn't give evidence. Manipulation? That doesn't happen, does it? Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> so they, they managed to... Um, avoid the families given the evidence, which would have been very emotional for a jury, because in America it's a jury trial, by saying you had to prove the science first, you had to prove they polluted the river, which became a very technical thing. The jury didn't really understand it. And one of the defendants defended it. And that meant that they didn't get as much compensation. They couldn't afford to carry on with the case. And eventually they had to settle it for a much lower sum. And it basically bankrupted him. He bankrupted his firm. He got some money for the families, but he didn't get anywhere near what he would have got if he'd settled. But he wanted, he wanted this pursuit of justice. And it's very important as a lawyer that you don't get too emotionally involved in the cases. You have to step back and do the right thing for the client, not because you decide you want it or the client wants a day in court. It's client's want the, uh, the right resolution to the case and a day in court doesn't always bring that and if you lose in court it certainly doesn't bring it so you have to be very careful and then after he'd lost the case bankrupt and everything he discovered that one of the defendants had hidden some evidence so he tried to reopen the case because he couldn't let it go he couldn't reopen it but eventually he sent all of the papers to the um, Environmental Protection Agency and they have eventually those defendants got had the biggest fine in US history. They were fined $68 million for what happened, but it left him bankrupt. And Although luckily he made millions out of the book and the film, so he did all right in the end. Good will always overcome evil or greed. Excellent. I love it. I'm going to read it immediately. Okay. A Civil Action by Jonathan Ha. That could definitely go into the Oral Apothecary Library. Good choices. Thank you for that, Steve. I know it was a little bit different for you, but hopefully different for the listener. And that's what we're trying to do, move things along and, and take slightly different angles. So it's me on the introduction to the micro discussion this week. So you can go make a cup of tea, Gibbo normally says. But I'm going to keep this brief because Jamie's already mentioned it. It is a paper by... Anthony Cox, who we've used before, and Robin Ferner. They're out of the University of Birmingham. They do a lot on adverse drug reactions, and it's from BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine from December 2021, actually. It's very up-to-date. As Jamie said, this is them looking at a couple of cases where coroners have written and said, look, we're trying to prevent uh, future deaths. I think they're called Regulation 28. Is that right, Steve? And it's about two cases of tramadol. And what, very, very briefly, one is an 84 year old man with dementia who had stockpiled tramadol for years and died, obviously, with a tramadol overdose in their blood. And the second one was a 36 year old patient who also was using and taking excessive amounts of tramadol mainly because they were ordering and requesting and being given their tramadol prescriptions twice a month rather than once a month. And in both cases, essentially, the coroners are writing and saying, look, hang on a minute, there seems to be a system issue here. What are you going to do about trying to prevent controlled drugs, which tramadol is, 
from being used and stored and overused and then ultimately causing death. So Steve, I think you probably had a look at it. What did you have to say about this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I personally have dealt with a number of cases involving these sorts of issues. It all comes down to the amount of time that the person prescribing the medication has got to identify what's going on with that patient. And you think about it, um, the GPs now are a very limited periods of time that they can spend with patients. I'm sure it's the same with anyone who's prescribing medication. And I think all of these sorts of cases, you need time to work out what is going on with the patient. Um, why are they on this medication for so long? Are there any other alternatives? Uh, is the patient feeling any sort of level of mental health issues that might cause some concern? Are they taking their medication regularly or are they stockpiling it? Certainly the issue with the two, get, getting it twice a month, just having some sort of review of what's going on, would, you would have thought would have, would have picked that up. But I think a lot of this comes down to time. So if you think about like in the modern world with all of us being obsessed with Amazon and getting things quickly and then online pharmacies, you can see all sorts of issues at some point in the future where all that's concerned. You're trying to save on cost, aren't you? So you're trying to say, if, if you've got to make do a million prescriptions a week, you want to try and make the cost per prescription a reasonable amount. But at some point, you are going to miss something serious in that amount of people if you decide that it's saving money is more important than doing the, the proper analysis of that. And I suspect a few years ago that that wouldn't have been the case or 20 or 30 years ago, the GP may have had time to, to assess it more, more carefully. Is time a defence, though? They talk about this, don't they? And they say, well, the defence might be that we didn't have time. Is that legally? Can you defend that? No. Not in my not in my world. You know, you would you'd really struggle. I didn't think you could. No, but that, that what I'm talking about whether you can avoid the error or not. You can't you can't defend the fact that you were given someone double the amount of medication for a couple of years because you didn't have time to assess it, or even I didn't have time to work out what was going on with that patient and they they stockpiled the medication. Whether that would be a breach of duty that they stockpiled it, that you'd have to look into exactly what happened in the case. But the pure issue of saying oh, I just didn't have time would be a difficult yeah, defense. It's pretty much indefensible isn't it you can't use that as a defense and that's the difficulty that we all have that working in the nhs you know i've been here for 30 years and remained a clinician and whenever i'm training people i always say look once your prints have touched it if you think about it if you haven't seen it well you're not involved are you but once you are involved if you haven't been able to do what you're supposed to do then it's going to be difficult to defend yeah a private organization might look at it differently can you imagine if it was subcontracted the prescription of a million a prescription was subcontracted to a private company they may think well look how much are we how much can we charge per prescription what's the risk of an adverse event how what's the cost of an adverse event and they they'll they'll work out what what is an acceptable amount but it's very difficult in medicine to do that because an acceptable harm might it might be two people dying well that's not acceptable in anyone's book is it that's why it is difficult to look at this more commercially you have to look at it from a safety perspective the papers they're part of a series aren't they in um, bmj evidence-based medicine and so part of what anthony cox and robin fern are trying to do is suggest how the PFDs, the Prevention Future Death Reports, how we make more use of the information that's contained in those coroner cases. And in this paper, they describe two tragic cases, both ended in fatality. One, they talk about the organisational response from the NHS in England, they suggested was they responded late by issuing bland and general statements. Then the one at GP practice level, all these responses are available on the the judiciary website as well. And so you've got the academic article there that describes a case study that we're all used to, an 84 four-year-old gentleman on the judiciary website you've got names and dates of birth you know this is the real human bit that this is that all that information is on the judiciary website in the response to and from the coroner and so at the practice level they did a search of all their patients they found they had 90 patients on tramadol that the vast majority of them were well managed and well looked after and then they found that there was a few more that perhaps were slipping through the net so the purpose of the paper that we've just read was partly to highlight are we missing a trick in improving patient safety with the coroner's reports and how could we improve our implementation of that yeah and i think that's spot on and i think it i think what steve was saying just before that supports that in that on the one hand my reaction to what you said there steve was how tough that must be on the doctor who's maybe getting finding himself under litigation for the fact that he didn't have enough time to do something and that doesn't seem fair and i still think that but on the other hand if it wasn't for that and what we've learned from that then things may never change for his 
him and his doctor colleagues in the future. I really enjoyed reading these, Jamie, for that reason, that they are great sources of, of, of learning and, and having been involved in implementing coroner's recommendations in the past. There's a bit of a dual approach. Sometimes it can feel a bit tick box um, in that, you know, the coroner said this, so we'll do this. But actually, perhaps what needs to be done more is, is as you said, a more in-depth read of these full reports and what can be learned from them. I don't know if that happens. It may well do. Um, I've not done one for a while. Listen to this. It's action should be taken. In my opinion, action should be taken to prevent future deaths. And I believe you, Sir Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of NHS England, have the power to take such action. That's in the one report. And then this one, so that's Sir Simon Stevens, Chief Executive of NHS In the next one, in separate case, in my opinion, action should be taken to prevent future deaths. And I believe you, the practice manager of such and such surgery, have the power to take such action. So they're very, you know, the different levels and the different responses that they, they describe in that paper are... Um, very interesting. I didn't respond to these, but I was working at NHS England for a very short period of time. And one of my jobs was to help write the responses for Sir Simon Stevens at the time for things like this. And they are incredibly difficult when they come in like that. And I don't know, Steve, what you think about and if you know any coroners. And I have been in a coroner's court. I had to go as a witness. Um, it's not easy. It's really difficult on the people who were directly involved in it. And I'm sure, like in all professions, you know, they're a lot. Most of them are great, but sometimes you get them and you think, well, honestly, why have you sent this to this level? And like the two cases you've just said, Jamie, one decided to send it to NHS England, and that was the first case, which is actually more difficult to fix because that's the one where the person had dementia and they were hoarding, and we don't know whether it was intentional or unintentional. Whereas the second one, where it sounds like when they wrote to the practice and the practice said, oh yes, we'll search all patients and we'll find them. Let's be honest, they were much more at fault, weren't they? Because they were allowing somebody to request their prescriptions every two weeks you know you know that you've got something to defend there don't you so do you see what I mean there's a real difference between the two um, when I was sat working at NHS England I would try to think about and I think this is what the papers are about which is how do you change the system because we don't want just the coroner in Hertfordshire to be worried about what's going on in Hertfordshire we want the example that happened in Hertfordshire which could happen in go right back to Steve's story about you know the Swiss cheese and what can happen on a certain day we all damn well know that all of these things could happen in anywhere and it has to be a system approach and that's what these papers are trying to say isn't it we can gain more by looking at them rather than looking at them in glorious isolation which is what can happen this is the big difficulty the nhs has as an overall organization is that there's pockets of really good risk management often that's because they take a real passionate view on risk management in that particular area but to try and spread that from the top across all of the hospitals with all of the different ways that people deal with risk management on the coal face is incredibly difficult and put my personal experience of coroners 20 uh, regulation 28 letters and pfds and all of that sort of stuff is i've got some quite good experiences locally and some quite poor ones but I've, I've definitely seen some good ones where where the letter's gone locally and the local hospital or local gp practice or whatever it is has done a really good job to try and put in a process that will avoid it happening again i've never seen anything that's gone sort of to the top and seen a whole policy that's come down that's actually made a difference now, that's maybe because it takes time to come down from the top or but i find the nhs struggles with that communication from the top to everywhere and maybe it's because when you get a memo with a policy that applies to everyone, do you actually think, are you engaged with that policy? Are you thinking, oh, that's, it's relevant to us. Where you have something that actually happens on your doorstep and then you investigate it and you think, and you, you know what it is and you, you feel engaged with it, you then put in place a policy that you feel that we have to comply with. For the record, when they come to NHS England, they come with ridiculous like everything, it seems, with law, they come with ridiculous deadlines. Like, can we have an answer by next week? Yeah, coroners quite like that. They <laughs> like a quick and, and, and you can't fix something as big as that if you've only got a week or two weeks to write your response. So you get what you pay for, don't you? If you only give somebody a certain amount of time to fix world poverty, you're not going to fix world poverty. The 21 days isn't really going to do it, is it? I don't think. But in the law, 21 days or 28 days is our sort of standard response time. So <laughs> I think that's probably it. It actually takes three years for the case to actually complete, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, that does, yeah. The wheels of justice. Okay, thanks all. A big thank you to Steve for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing his stories, his Desert Island Drug, his career anthem and his book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Tracy Brown. Tracy is an award-winning pharmacist from Glasgow, recognised for her work on deprescribing and pain management. In particular, her work with patients taking benzodiazepines and opioids. We look forward to catching up with Tracy next time on the Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn 
and TikTok. Only joking, just a matter of time, though. <laughs> you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Over to Gimmo for the final ingredient. Okay, so thanks, Steve. That was brilliant. That was really interesting. A common theme on the podcast is how to get the effect of drugs without actually taking the drugs. We've also talked about the lack of evidence for medicines in tackling stress and anxiety. Well, I've got something that you can take that's been shown to reduce stress levels by 68%. And what's more, it's something that we prescribe right here on this podcast. That's right. It's a book. Or to be more precise, in reading. 